Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is John Gray, Emeritus Professor of European Thought at the London School of Economics. Of all his many publications, none has had greater impact or higher sales than his 2002 book, Straw Dogs. The book is short, aphoristic, deeply challenging to many of our fundamental beliefs, a profound reassessment of what it means to be human. One of the book's many admirers, novelist Will Self, described it in The Independent as that rarest of things, a contemporary work of philosophy devoid of jargon, wholly accessible and profoundly relevant to the rapidly evolving world we live in. Psychologist Adam Phillips called it at once daunting and unsettling, and the journalist Brian Appleyard hailed it as unquestionably one of the great works of our time. When I met John, and before we got to the contents of the book, I asked him to explain the title. A common question about straw dogs is where does the title come from and um, although there was a a well-known and even uh, almost notorious film with that title the origin of the title is not from the film it may be indeed that the title of the film came from where my title came from which is in a Chinese mystical text the Tao Te Ching a Taoist text in which there are some lines which say that um, the heavens are ruthless they treat humans as straw dogs and if you investigate what straw dogs meant in um, ancient Chinese thought and practice straw dogs were ritual objects created from straw which during the rituals were treated with extreme a respect and reverence but when the rituals were over were trampled into the dirt or disregarded and so one of the themes of straw dogs is uh, reflected in that title in that I aim to set out a view of things in which humans are not central in the world in which the kind of centrality that they've enjoyed in Western religion is not assumed and indeed it's assumed not that the universe is malevolent, or, but that the universe is indifferent to humans, and that therefore, as it were, f- and will treat humans ruthlessly if humans uh, act so as to disrupt processes of life. So uh, one of the applications of this idea, I suppose, in the book is that in the Gaia theory of James Lovelock, the earth not the universe as a whole but the earth the the planet our planet is understood as being in certain respects like a single organism and a single organism which will readjust its component parts in order to carry on living as a single organism and if one of those parts the human species has uh, disrupted the system as a whole then the readjustments that will take place will have no regard for human well-being or human survival they'll simply be the adjustments which will lead to another stable state even if in that stable state there are far fewer humans so humans will be treated as straw dogs if you like by Gaia the book appeared in 2002 John and I wondered how 9-11 came in the writing of the book had you begun the book before it happened? Did it Was it in any way catalytic of some of the ideas in it? 9-11 was not central to straw dogs, but it did illustrate one of the themes of straw dogs, and in fact figures in straw dogs, in a, a short section in straw dogs, in that one of the illusions that straw dogs is intended to, um, intended to dispel or correct is the idea that there's something inherently good about modernity, about being modern, and that the worst phenomena in the world are somehow atavisms or regressions to earlier states of human history. So people say things like, well, Hitler was taking the world, taking Europe back to medievalism, or Al-Qaeda is a, a movement or a network which, whose goals are medieval. Of course, there may be something in, of, that, of truth in that in respect of Al-Qaeda at any rate because um, some of the Islamist ideology associated with Al-Qaeda talks about renewing ancient caliphates and so forth. But 
My point in the book is that Nazism and certain of the more extreme forms of Islamism as well as of other modern phenomena are genuinely and truly modern, not only in the sense that they are possible actually only by using modern technology. I mean, in the case of Al-Qaeda, relatively simple modern technology uh, when they uh, perpetrated 9-11, but much more complex technology because they're also a virtual organization that uses the web a lot and um, has encrypted websites and so on and so forth. So, it's, But they're modern not only in the sense that they use these um, contemporary technologies and could only really exist at the global level. They do exist, or did exist, Al-Qaeda, in a world which in which these technologies are common and central, but also in their goals. And this is what I think is not understood because um, if you would say what goal, well, what are the goals which are distinctive of modern cultures or civilizations? Well, I guess the idea of transforming society so as to accord with some model or utopia or a dream of conflictless human community, which can be achieved in the future and perhaps even in the near future particularly by violent measures, by extreme forms of violence, I think is, is a modern goal. I mean, until very recently in human history, last few hundred years, there have always been dreams of a perfect or harmonious, harmonious society, even of utopia. But mostly they were put in the irrecoverable past or in parts of the world which weren't yet on the map. So the idea that such a harmonious, peaceful, nearly perfect community realizing all human aspirations or all the really valuable or important ones could be achieved in the future and could be achieved through human action and not through divine intervention and even more could be achieved by the systematic use of uh, lethal force and violence that's distinctively modern and it's what the Bolsheviks had in common with um, the Nazis so there are important differences between them and what they both have in common with um, Al-Qaeda to that extent um, it is an important feature of the book, although only a short part of the book deals with that. It is important because it's intended to attack and undermine, or at least to put in the minds of readers a question mark over this idea that being modern is always good. Some of the worst features of the world we live in are the most modern. It doesn't mean that I or, or the book recommends ceasing to be modern because being modern is a a fate for us. We can't go back to any pre-modern uh, situation or, or, or civilization. And also there are many good features about being modern like um, anesthetic dentistry, public health, longevity and um, modern features of life like a degree of tolerance, um, the emancipation of women, better treatment for in some contexts of the world at some times for the weak and so on. But um, being modern has in fact also included some of the very, very worst things that have happened in the 20th century. Nothing as terrible as the Holocaust happened before the 20th century. There were many pogroms and many forms of persecution. But nothing as terrible as that happened and there were many reasons for that, including the invention of a pseudo-scientific category of race in the 19th century. But also uh, what was necessary for a, a unique crime uh, as the Holocaust was, was a certain type of technology, a certain type of transportation, a certain type of industrialization of mass killing. So um, I have wanted to implant in the reader's mind a, quest a question about being modern. In addition to things mm. such as progress and modernity, which mm. you've spoken about, mm. you also want to present a serious challenge to other mm. cherished ideas and ideals mm. such as our notion of morality mm. as a guide to our actions, mm. our sense of self, mm. our sense of, of free will, mm. and so on. So there are, there are, there are some very mm. thoroughgoing challenges mm. going on beyond the sort of grand ideological level mm. uh, as to how we actually think about ourselves. Well, one goal of um, Straw Dogs is to bring our way of thinking about ourselves closer to the way we actually experience ourselves. Because there's a, a, a strong tendency in Western thought, I would say in all human thought, but it can, I know the West, Western thing better, and maybe it's even more accentuated in certain respects in Western thought than in other types of thought, to um, develop conceptions of humans 
self-consciousness, human freedom of action, human agency, which really and take those conceptions as being in a sense descriptive of the way we are when they're really highly idealized and um, almost hyperbolic uh, developments of how we'd like to be. So I think it's a kind of commonplace experience that over a complete lifetime at any rate and even sometimes in shorter life, shorter periods of a lifetime, people find themselves having not only conflicting impulses but not having the kind of highly fixed set um, identity that their religious and philosophical tradition says that all human beings have. I mean, it's false to experience. And of course, a lot of modern art, a lot of modern literature has challenged this uh, self-image, this inherited self-image in which we are highly cohesive, coherent agents, authors of our lives, implementing them step by step and so forth. But philosophy oh, and um, more abstract types of thinking outside of the arts, I think has tended still to operate with these images. We talk about wanting to be autonomous, which means, um, as it were, inscribing our lives with our intentions, when we all know that much of our lives are the products of chance or involuntary experience, or of on the more positive side, creativity which or, cre or decisions which turn out to be wonderful decisions and to be very fruitful in our lives, which at the time we can't explain or maybe never explain. So um, it's intended to correct this highly idealized self-image, not in order to flatten um, our experience of ourselves or to flatten our hopes, but to actually see how so much of our lives, including their most creative aspects and phases are products of what might be called animal sagacity rather than of the sort of self-reflective autonomous decision making which we like to imagine that we have and which we so rarely have and which we might be better off not having more of. Certainly we're better off not being wholly like that because if so much of our creativity comes from mental life, kind of organic life which is not conscious and cannot be conscious in many cases, then we would impoverish ourselves by getting closer to that ideal. So in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's a criticism of um, ideals, human ideals. Human ideals are sort of commonly thought to be terribly good things. I don't think they are that uh, good. I think that they have, and what's bad about them is not that they can't be achieved. If it could achieve them, the world would be much poorer than it is. It's that the ideals themselves are too one-sided and leave out too much and don't understand enough about the way we like other animals and of course one of the one of the core uh, ideas of the book is that although we differ from human animals and from other animals in important respects we've had much greater evolutionary success unlike any other that we know we do philosophize about ourselves and um, we don't know that dolphins do for example we might be unique on this planet and having these capacities and um, tastes for self-reflection and so on but we do remain an animal animals not like animals we are animals just are and that's part a large part of our the animal status that we have our standing as animals not something that we should strive desperately to shake off or transcend it's something from which our most much of our creativity even comes even the creativity which is expressed in forms of activity which no other animal can emulate mm. that creativity very often comes from our animal inheritance then passed through the filter or passed through the activities that other animals um, don't have and and so uh, it's really wanted to reclaim that animal inheritance as something valuable you talk about distinguishing between the untruths mm. we can jettison mm. and those untruths which we yeah. need in order to yeah. Yeah. to exist. Mm -hmm. That then that, that seems to me quite an interesting way to to um, the way to sort of pursue the, the, yeah. the themes of the book. Yes, I mean, do we need a conception of free will in order to, for example, do we need an illusion of free will? In order? Now, many people would say we do. Uh, we can't. Perhaps we do. Did Plato have a conception of free will, or the people? In Plato's time, did they have, or Homer's time, did uh, the Buddha have a conception of free will? It might be quite a parochial conception, at least 
the, 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 the intense preoccupation with questions of free will. I mean, there are glimmerings of interest in it in ancient Greece with and Rome with writers like Epicurus talking about atoms swerving and so the world's not wholly determined and fixed and so on. But I think that the, 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 the intense, almost obsessional preoccupation with free will is more distinctively part of late Christian and post-Christian civilization. So I, I think we could do without an idea of free will. I mean, we might feel that we're acting when on a, another view we're not acting. But as I say in the book, it may turn out that free will is just a trick of perspective. Depends how we look at ourselves and how we ex experience it. But still, there will be what I call illusions in the book, or which could all alternatively be called myths. There might well be, and I think there will be, myths we can't do without. And then the question is, which myths can which people not do without? And they might not all be the same myths. They might differ uh, between and within cultures and civilizations, or maybe conceivably within between people, and even conceivably within a single person's lifetime. It's kind of very interesting, interesting question. Well, I mean, I think one idea that the book certainly wants to question and does question is the idea that a whole civilization, or even a single person, can exorcise illusion or mythic thinking from their minds entirely. That is, seems to me, to be an illusion or a myth. And it's, it's Whenever it's attempted, it produces bizarre results, because typically what happens is that the, the beliefs connected with the myth or the illusion might get rejected or inverted or negated. But the pattern of the myth is renewed in Freud, the return of the repressed, but in some other form. And so you might say, I completely, some people would say they completely reject the idea of divine providence working throughout history. But then when you look at their thinking, if they're Marxists or certain types of um, liberals, uh, um, what they'll see is human history moving through a variety of um, phases everywhere in the world. And as being a single enterprise, history is a kind of a single enterprise. And it's an enterprise not of God, but in, now, in that case of humankind. But if you really think of humans in a naturalistic manner, and that's to say as animals like other animals, we don't think of tigers as all having a single tigerish enterprise which they pursue in their different ways, or uh, gorillas, as it were, gradually working out the telos of gorilladom, that's to say they're going all kind of some kind of ideal, hen ideal gorilla that they're all working towards. They each live their own lives and they have various cultures and communities, we now, re 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 we now understand. They also have types of ethics, they care for each other and they um, uh, have sympathy and so forth but they they, they, they aren't a kind of um, uh, an agent acting in the world so that although Marxists and some liberals and progressive thinkers very often reject providentialist religious beliefs in divine providence as they reject the beliefs the category of thinking the way of thinking about human history recurs Re renews itself, returns, uh, as the idea of history as a, a single continuous enterprise, which in my view definitely is not. The book, John, has been a, an international bestseller, mm -hmm. sold in, in many languages. Um, you were saying earlier it's the, the, the most successful book that you've, you've written. And I wondered if you sort of thought about what accounts for that. Mm -hmm. Did it come at just the right time, as we said, in the, in the wake of 9-11, where perhaps people are being very self-questioning? And also, did it depend on you finding the right form mm. for these ideas? Because the book is aphoristic, it's mm. written in short sections, it's got intriguing, provocative titles. Have you thought about what, what it was about it that really touched such a, a nerve? I have thought about why the book had the impact that it has had and continues to have. I think there are a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, George, you just mentioned, which is the timing of the publication of the book. It was written, part of it was written before 9-11, but it was published after 9-11, and there, are, there was a small section in it about 9-11. And that event, that terrible event, terrorist attack, it introduced a, a note of interrogation into, to no one expected it, and it combined um, almost near inconceivability with ubiquitous presence through the mass media of technology, through this kind of sp spectacular attack on uh, spectacular atrocity, which is what it was. 
so that might have sensitized people to some of the ideas in the book as to how the book was written it was written in the way it was partly because I, I had no idea when I wrote it of what the audience of the book would be in that sense it was true that I wrote it for myself because I like reading aphoristic books and they're not terribly uncommon in fact it's an established genre in many languages apart from English there aren't many English books of aphorisms or of aphoristic writings, but there are lots and lots of French books mm. and lots and lots of German books and some Russian books and so on. It's, 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 it's a common genre, but just not in English. But I like reading that type of book. It enables one to, when reading it, to um, fertilize one's thinking through a short, concentrated set of statements. And uh, I also found writing it very interesting and also challenging because in order to write like this one has to really pare the thinking down to its most essential elements writing a, a book of aphorisms is like it's a sculptural task just as important as what you put in put in is what you take out and of course one of the things i one of the things i took out were all the caveats and preambles and postambles of academic thought and uh, um, an academic discourse and that was completely deliberate so the book consists of a series of assertions, really, and of questions, but of assertions. If you looked at it from an academic, I would say, well, you know, what about 15 caveats which can apply to, be applied to the statement or uh, 22 counter-arguments and so on? Well, they may be important in academic treatises, but I have no interest at all in them from the standpoint of the book. Uh, because the, the point of the book is not to persuade. It's not to present a series of reasonings which are almost coercively persuasive. It's simply to present a series of thoughts as clearly and as um, forcefully in some ways as I can, which in a sense the reader can take or leave, or as I would put it in a different way, they can take and use what they want and lay the rest aside.